My name is Magdalena Vrobel, and I'm an Associate Director of Public History at Leo Beck Institute, New York, Berlin. For those of you who might join us for the first time, Leo Beck Institute was established in 1955 by a group of German Jewish intellectuals. There are three independent branches of LBI in New York, London, and Jerusalem. Leo Beck Institute in New York has also an office in Berlin, which represents and coordinates our activities in Germany. And LBI New York Berlin is the biggest depository of documents donated by German speaking Jewish emigres. For years, the Institute has served scholars and researchers. And the newest initiative, our public history department, aims to bring German Jewish history to a broader audience, including non-academics. Today, I have a pleasure to moderate a very special event focusing on the immigration of European Jews to colonial India before and during World War II. By the time that uh, borders of Europe were closed during the World War II, about 1,000 European Jews found refuge in what is today India and Pakistan. And at Leobeck Institute, we have many collections of people who found temporary home in places like Kolkata, Karachi, Bombay, or Bangalore. The base for the conversation today is the movie Rafting to Bombay. It's a story of a boy whose family found refuge in colonial India during World War II. He returned to Mumbai in November 2008 and was caught in the worst terror attack in the history of the city. The dire situation brings many memories back and presents present the main character with many new questions. And now please let me introduce our three great panelists. I will go in the order that I will talk to them. Nahum Laufer was born in 1935 in Sham of Poland. During World War II, he and his mother escaped occupied Poland uh, on a journey that ended up in Bombay, India. And those of you who watched the movie, you will immediately know that Nahum and his story is the base for rafting to Bombay. I would also like to mention Nahum's son, who's also here, Erez Laufer, um, who you can see a lot in the movie. Erez Laufer is a well-known and established filmmaker in the documentary world. He's the editor of two highly appreciated Oscar nominees, The War Room and My Country, My Country. And as far as I know, Miri Laufer, Nahum's daughter, Who's also, who you can also see in the movie, is also a film director. And Nahum and Eretz are today in Tel Aviv. Our second panelist is Dr. Yael Silliman. Uh, she's an author, scholar, and women's rights activist. She was born into the Baghdadi Jewish community in Kolkata and received her education, just to name a few places, at Harvard University, UT Austin, and she received her doctor, doctoral degree in international education at Columbia University. And her recent publications include The Tik Almira and Where Gods Reside, Sacred Places of Kolkata. And I would also like to mention her another publication, extremely interesting book, Jewish Portraits, Indian Frames, Women's Narratives from a Diaspora of Hope. It's a fascinating story of women in Yael's family, starting with, with Yael's great grandmother coming to Kolkata to be married. And Yael is today with us and she will speak from Kolkata. Thank and you. the third panelist is Professor Atina Grossman. Atina is a professor of history in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at the Cooper Union in New York City. She received her PhD from Rutgers University. Her current research focuses on trauma, privilege, adventure in transit, Jewish refugees from national socialism in Iran, India, and Central Asia in transnational contexts. She has, and earlier before that, um, she has shed light on Jewish life in Germany in the immediate aftermath of World War II bridging the divide between German history, German history and Jewish studies. 
And Professor Grossman has received many professorships and fellowships. I would just mention two Humboldt at Humboldt University Berlin and Friedrich Schiller University in Vienna. And I would also like to mention two of her publications. Of course, there are many more. We just don't have that much time here. When Biology Became Destiny, Women in Weimar and Nazi Germany, and Reforming Sex, the German Movement for Birth Control and Abortion Reform, 1920-1950, published by Oxford University Press. And um, Athena is today with us in New York. And by this occasion, I would also like to thank my colleague and our project manager, Sophie Roof, who helped uh, to co-organize this event. And I know that our audience today is in New York, in other uh, American US cities, as well as in Europe, Israel, and I know we also have a few guests from India. So I would like to welcome everybody. And I'm, I'm very happy that we could make such a great transnational Zoom event. And before we will come to the conversation, uh, I would like us um, to watch first uh, two clips from the movie um, that will um, bring a better context to the further conversation. My father Nahum was five years old when he escaped with his mother from the Nazis in 1940. They met my grandfather in Italy and migrated to Turkey. When they couldn't get an entrance visa to Palestine, they decided to go to Iraq by rafting over the Tigris River, planning to cross the desert to Israel illegally. Since I was a boy, I remember my father telling me about this journey. The wild mountains of Kurdistan and Kurd sailors who build rafts out of inflated sheepskins. A picture of them sailing on the river for eight days. One boy among a group of refugees, passing picturesque villages, camping on a riverbank and sleeping in caves. All these are fragments of the experience that my father remembers as a magical childhood adventure, the journey by Raf to Bombay. So how did my family end up in Bombay? The raft brought them to Baghdad. But Baghdad was a trap. There was a pro-Nazi rebellion against the British government. They lived in a Fleabag hotel as Polish citizens and hid the fact that they were Jewish. On my father's birthday, on May 29, 1941, there was a pogrom against the Jews. My father remembers getting cardboard games of snacks and ladders, but no one was in the mood to play with him. The family then fled to Basra in an attempt to find a ship and leave Iraq. After repeated requests to the British Council, they were issued a visa to India. With their last penny, they bought tickets and boarded the ship to Bombay, where they lived for seven years. Okay, thank you. Um, so th this is a great example. And I have to say, I watched the movie three times. And Nahum, I would first like to hear uh, what convinced you to make the movie? So uh, we, we see in the movie that the, uh, the interview with your mom, your mother was actually taken many years earlier before um, the movie was made. So, and in November, 2008, you are going to Mumbai. So what happened in between and uh, between the interview with your mother and the trip to Mumbai? Okay, I, at, uh, at a certain point in, in the late 90s, I, didn't, I learned. You can close the, uh, 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 I wrote a, a short note to, to Yad Vashem about a child uh, escaping. They asked me to come for an interview and it was a long interview, maybe three hours. 
and by the, at the end of the interview, the, the cameraman who was silent all the three hours uh, tells me a sentence. I have seen here hundreds of, of uh, interviews and one like uh, the story you are telling, I haven't heard. So I, I, I understood that I had a, a story that, uh, that others don't know about. But at that time already my parents were, were both already passed away. Uh, and uh, I couldn't ask them any more questions than what I knew already. And one thing that uh, disturbed me, why did they go to Iraq? They could have remained in, 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 in Turkey. And so I went to the, uh, to the archive of, of the Haganah with, uh, with a thought that maybe there I can find a, a hint. And uh, what I found out uh, was that uh, uh, the story of the Darya. Abba, ma te sa parlem al Darya nasha. No, 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 no. I'm saying. Tikanesta. To cross them, <laughs> and and, uh, and then then I start, I went to a swimming school uh, to to write a, 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 a write a, 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 a to write a, 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 a film uh, about a film about our journey, but what I wrote was uh, was half fiction, but half, uh, uh, half true, something that, uh, as Eric says, uh, not Bollywood, together with Hollywood, wouldn't, wouldn't be able to do it, because there were uh, the scenes uh, of hundreds of people, riots and, uh, and so on. Uh, First, and at that time, I, I found out another story that happened in, in Istanbul when we were there, when, when, when we were, uh, before we went to Iraq. And this happened when the Haganah, uh, when the people of the Aliyah Beit refused to take orders from, from Tel Aviv, and uh, a sort of a mutiny. We made a film about that, it's called Darian Dilemma. Uh, and uh, um, and uh, at the end, when I made, uh, I, at the end, I did understand something that, uh, why we went to Iraq. The Turks, the police were taking refugees and put, they put them, uh, put them on the ship by force. On the on the uh, on the Adia uh, ship Darian, which was already packed with 800 people, so I, I can understand. I understood that maybe my, uh, my parents and and six other families decided to uh, let, let's get out of here of Turkey, and and the only way was it was impossible to go straight to to Palestine. Well, Syria was blocked. It was in the hand of the Vichy still. That's the reason. Uh, that's the reason and that then, it took so long. Okay. Yeah, and then second. and when you and when you arrived in uh, in India in Mumbai in Bombay back then, then um, the story has completely changed. May maybe we can also show the map uh, right now as yes, the trip. Okay actually looked like when uh, while we are talking um and uh, you mentioned in the movie um that you you actually call this um we can see now the map and and at the same time we can also talk um so you mentioned Nahum that uh, you, you've been a being a refugee in india without knowing that you are a refugee that's a very nice thing to say about the um the, the stay in india could you tell us a bit more about your experience, your your child memories from those years? 
uh, in those years, uh, in the end, uh, I went to to a preschool and, and, and to school in India at the Cathedral High School, which is, uh, an, uh, which is uh, the, uh, one of the best uh, uh, schools in, in India. It still uh, is. Uh, so uh, and uh, and I had a lot. I had uh, it was ex it wasn't too ex pleasant to to go to the school, but anyhow, uh, it uh, I that's uh, that's how what I wanted to say that uh, in India is a, is a country of classes. Everyone knows where to where he belongs, uh, uh, to the high class of Brahmi, the, the, the middle class, uh, middle classes, and uh, and the uh, unfit uh, low class. There's another was another class, the Sahib class, the the, the ruler, the Sahib, the the, the Europeans. Uh, when I I managed to read read the. Athena's book about her father, that he is in prison, but he has a servant because he's a sahib. That they, they wanted to to keep the the, the the Europeans in a higher class, and if he's in prison, then the, the, then then he should have a a, a servant. Uh, so on, uh, I could go to the. Uh, to beach candy, uh, swimming pool, but my friend Sam uh, couldn't go there because he was uh, uh, from uh, uh, from Iraqi origin, and and uh, so on. Uh, so, became... oh yeah, I think I, I think those that are from Mumbai, they know yeah. exactly the context where all those places are, and uh, yeah. I think. Um, Atina and Yael can give us a little bit more of the historical context soon. Um, but before we will get to the next question, I actually wanted us to uh, watch a short excerpt from the movie. Um, so Sophie, please. Somebody told us to try and join the hotel. Here. We are in the problem for that girl. Okay, so we understand. You for... can go and check in four season. They will give you. Room. You're watching the continuous coverage of what can only be described as a war there in Mumbai. This is how the situation stands as we speak. A fresh round of firing reported from Hotel Taj. Fire still rages on in parts of the hotel at the Oberoi Fierce. Gun battle still on at the Nariman house as well. A death toll stands at 125. Over 300 have been injured. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
Lord, pardon me, hostages, Lord, pardon me. אני לא רוצה להשפיע, אני לא רוצה, זה לא... לא, זה לא צריך להשפיע, בואי... היא ניסתה מהרהרת בכל רעם. יכול להיות שאם היינו יכולים למצוא כיסא, נגיד תוך כמה שעות, היינו אומרים, אוקיי, יאללה, בוא נסגור את זה וניסע. אבל נראה לי שזה לא המצב, אז אנחנו כל מקרה תקועים. מכיוון שלא ברור בכלל מה קורה פה בתוך העיר. זה ברור אם נותנים הוראה לאנשים לשער בבתים, וזה ברור מאוד שהעסק לא נגמר וזה יימשך פה. Okay. So we just watched one of the most uh, dramatic moments of the movie. And uh, this is, of course, about a, uh, it shows the terrorist attack that happened in Mumbai. So, um, and, and this is basically exactly the time when you, Nahum, uh, came uh, for the first time after so many years back to Mumbai. And, and you landed in an extremely difficult moment for, for the city also for the Jewish community in Mumbai, as, as we see this in the movie, and, and for India. And, and just for those that maybe uh, didn't see the movie and don't remember, so the, the attack was actually a series of 12 coordinated shooting and bombing attacks across the city, lasting from November 26th until um, November 29th. And when I watched this movie, it was very hard for me not to draw some kind of analogy. So when you came first time, um, you, you came with your parents and, um, and, and they of course tried to protect you from World War II. And, and when you came the second time, um, you, you came as a filmmaker, as an adult, but also as a father and husband. So uh, could you tell us how did you actually feel in this moment and what did you think about this situation? It was a very queer situation. Uh, we, we didn't, uh, we, we came to do something and we had the uh, responsibility to do the Yad Vashem that partly financed the, the trip. And uh, so, but, but on the other hand, uh, it's, uh, you can't, uh, uh, and I think that uh, the Holocaust, this was something like the Holocaust. At most, it was something like how the Nazis uh, used to uh, behave during the, the 1930s, before the war. Uh, it's a terror attack. And we are, we come from Israel and we are used to terror attacks. And, uh, you, you, life has to continue, even if there's a terror attack. I just wanted to, to mention uh, 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 your sentence. It wasn't 12 groups, it was six groups. Uh, 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 each one, uh, each group was two men uh, that, that uh, each took a different uh, um, uh, route to, to to, to kill. And by the way, we were, the next day, we were supposed to go to the Naraman house, the Habad uh, uh, house uh, for, for a Friday evening uh, meal. So uh, if they would have come a day later, then, then we would have been in, in trouble, uh, in real trouble. Uh, so, uh, we, uh, we, we we just hold up. Uh, we remained in the hotel uh, in, in in North Bombay, not 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 uh, not in the, near the Taj Mahal, where we had uh, already we, we were going to stay, and 
And uh, the next day, on Saturday, we even went to to a Bnei Israel synagogue somewhere out of of the city and uh, uh, to to film to film the the, the cricket. Uh, um, uh, the team that's going to the Maccabiya. Uh, so, uh, so it, it, it so it went on. Uh, and we and did, this will be. We decided to remain. <laughs> we, uh, uh, I think we felt safe enough uh, to to remain where we were. There was no police, a lot of police in this in that uh, area, except around one of the, the big hotels, Mario Hotel. There, there was the police there, but uh, like this, the the whole uh, the whole uh, north, uh, north part of the city was uh, was usual. The crowds outside, peddlers, uh, and shops, everything was open. And, um, and the movie was released a um, few years later after after the attack. Yeah, it takes time to make a movie if you have to edit yeah. it and and uh, right. and, uh, and so on. It took some time to to, to, right. to make. But but could you tell us about the initial responses uh, in Israel and uh, and other countries? This was still a fresh memory back then, uh, so. How did people react um, during the release? We had very uh, we had a few very good reviews, uh, and uh, people even ask for the film even today. Uh, we especially not so much from the Jewish community, like like the. But the South Asian community, because the Indians don't want to call themselves Indians in the U.S. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so, 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 so it goes along. And uh, yeah, and speaking of which, uh, let's let's see the next clip um, from the movie, uh, which gives us a little bit more information about the Jews in India. In the 40s in Bombay, there was a large established Jewish community of descendants of Baghdadi's Jews. And alongside them was the Bnei Israel community, which has lived in India for more than 2,000 years. These two communities were joined by the new Ashkenazi refugees from Europe. When we planned the trip back in Israel, we tried to coordinate a visit to the synagogue where my grandfather used to go during services. But it was hard to gather enough people to pray. But today the street by the synagogue is bustling and the remnants of the community have gathered from all over Bombay. In the summer, Bombay was like a boiling pot. The heavy heat and the high humidity made life for the Europeans unbearable. Every summer they had escaped the heavy heat and went up to the hills. They stayed in luxurious British hotels and enjoyed the pleasure of colonialism. My grandmother, who quickly changed her identity from a Jewish refugee to an English lady, loved their new lifestyle, the afternoon tea parties and the mountains hikes. The good life in Bombay always existed alongside my grandparents' fear for the faith of their family in Europe. But they didn't share their worries with my father and they let him live in the fantasy world of India a fantasy that he held on to for many years. So we just watched a short clip and we also heard Nahum's story um, about his uh, refuge in India. But this was actually not the first time in history when Jews found refuge in India. And Yael is the best person to talk about that. Yael, uh, could you tell us something about this? And also, could you uh, could you tell us more about your community, the Baghdadi Jews? Thank you so much. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
So um, as you know, um, India is a very special place in that it is the only place in the world that Jews have never faced anti-Semitism, except during Portuguese rule in Goa, where I happen to be today. That's due to um, the Inquisition. But Jews uh, came to India, as Nahum had mentioned in his film, 2000 years ago. And uh, we've had this long history of Jews coming to India for trading and other purposes. And my community, the Baghdadi Jewish community, for example, they came as commercial people, they came as traders. In fact, it's my grandfather seven times removed who came in 1793 uh, to India looking for commercial opportunities from Aleppo and Syria. They're called the Baghdadi Jews, and not really from Baghdad, but from all over the Middle East. And the community was also mostly Iraqi because over a period of time, many people from uh, the Middle East and Iraq especially faced problems and they came to India for refuge. And not only did they found a very hospitable country to which they came, but they also found that the Jewish community members, the Iraqi Jewish community, the Baghdadi Jewish community, and I'm specifically talking about Calcutta, similar in Bombay, but I'm limiting my comments to Calcutta, provided for the poor in the community they had free education, they, they had um, all kinds of allowances so that in one generation or even less, they could become a thriving members of the community. So we were a, a wealthy community, though 50% of our community was always poor, but lived on Jewish charities. We're extremely um, uh, aware of global Jewish events and actually were very philanthropic. Just at, uh, last week in the newspaper, we have a column which talks about 100 years ago today. And 100 years ago today, last week, was uh, 1922, when Calcutta's Jews and Parsis grouped together to help Ukrainian Jews um, who were in a famine between 1921 and 22. And these two minority communities, together with the British, set up a very uh, important fund for them. Not only did we respond to world events, we also responded um, to um, charities across the Middle East and, and within the countries in which we lived. And if we think of the Baghdadi Jews, we can't only think of them as being in Calcutta or in Bombay, but we spread from Basra to Shanghai. And in all these commercial port cities, there were the Baghdadi Jews who were related to each other uh, through business and through marriage and other ways they um, shared common religious practices, and uh, each of them, communities, were very, very philanthropic. Uh, I would give you an example, which seems rather odd, but in our synagogues, uh, there was always charity boxes for the holy places in Jerusalem, but there were European Jews who kept coming to India to look for charities. And there's one um, comment I was reading in a, in a historical um, account of our community, when so many European Jews were coming looking for charities, to India, this is not way before the Holocaust, we're talking about the 18th and 19th century, that they had to limit and see that they were actually people who were genuine because there were so many fakes among them. So uh, when the European Jews uh, came to Calcutta and to India, part of this tradition was to be hospitable. And not only did European Jews come to Calcutta, but we had our own cousins and relatives from, from Rangoon and from Shanghai, who were also Singapore, who were also escaping and came to Calcutta as refugees. So in the 1940s, our community was 5,000 members strong, which is the largest we'd ever been because we were buoyed by these refugees from different um, places. So I'll stop there because I know you have other questions to ask and there's limited time. So let me say that we were a trading community, extremely philanthropic, conservative, um, looked after our own um, and also welcomed and made sure that other Jews and others in need were taken care of. And, and then in the 1930s, uh, the, the Jews from Europe arrived. And um, where, where were, the, were there any um, European Jews um, and Jewish refugees in Kolkata during the World War II? Uh, um, did your parents um, had have any experience with them, and um, what could you tell us about the the European Jews in Kolkata in that time? Um, how how yes. did they relate to the Baghdadi Jewish community? What, what okay. were the relationship? 
So uh, my mother, who's 92 right now, remembers the European Jews very clearly, but I'm 67, and I also remember European Jewish refugees because some of them stayed on in India. So I'll tell you a little bit about them and who they were. Most of them were professionals um, who found refuge in India. My mother actually speaks about um, Dr. Handel, who had a medical practice in Calcutta, and she went uh, would go to him when she needed to see a doctor. She talked about when she needed her eyes checked, she would go to an ophthalmologist, Dr. Touch Keefe. She uh, talked about Dr. Greenbaum, who was a podiatrist who worked at the Barter Shoe Shop, and his daughter Ilsa became a protege of Lady Ezra. So there were many, many European Jews in professional places. There were musicians, many were musicians. My mother remembers particularly Liesl Stahli, who was an accomplished pianist. Um, and um, there's also an account recently, uh, not recent, written about uh, my friends, the Calcutta Jewish families by Elise Brown Barnett. And she talks about her memories of Calcutta Jews and the hospitality she received. She was also a mu musician. And uh, when she decided to stay on in India for a short period of time, she was here nine years altogether, she became director of Western music at All India Radio. Now, let me tell you a little bit, a funny story about the Calcutta Jews, which, um, you know, people remember stories. I said there were many professionals and there was also this German chemist, okay? And this German chemist, he was, uh, he was great at, you know, at his work. And he told his Jewish friends, the Baghdadi Jewish community, because they were integrated and came to synagogue and were part of community events, that he was able to distill Dewar's whiskey and make a spurious Dewar's whiskey that tasted exactly like the whiskey and nobody would know the difference. So, you know, the Jews were very enterprising and the E.E. E. Ezekiel and J.E. Gabe, they formed a company called Davidson Limited and they started to distill spurious whiskey and they would pour them in Dewar bottles. And this whiskey became so popular. It was used all over India. They needed to get more and more bottles. They started exporting it all over India. And then they got over ambitious. Um, they decided to export it to uh, Singapore. And when Dewar's in Scotland realized that they were actually selling more Dewar's whiskey in Singapore than they were sending out, they had, um, you know, their agency to come in and check out what was happening and they got caught. Uh, this was a very famous case. It was called the Garia Hutt case. It was 1939. Uh, the German uh, chemist uh, took King's evidence and got off free, but three Calcutta Jews went to prison for two and a half years. So I think that's a memorable story about um, the, the way in which they collaborated even uh, in crime. Um, I remember as a young girl, uh, several um, Jews who came to Calcutta because one of them settled down and was very, very close to our family. And that was uh, Bolik Wembom. He was part of a group of Polish men who came over from Japan and uh, they escaped to Calcutta. They didn't know how to speak English. They looked up the Jewish directory and they found a Jewish club and they came over and they received hospitality from, from the Jewish uh, community. And Bolik was very handsome. I remember him um, very well. He was stunningly handsome. And he was a basketball player. So he started teaching basketball at the Jewish girls' school, married a Calcutta Jewish woman, who was my mother's neighbor, Mercia Lembom, and uh, stayed on in Calcutta and eventually became a very big businessman and had his own mining company. I also remember Dr. Traub, who came just before the war, but couldn't go back. He was from Lithuania, and he was our dentist. And I remember Elsa, who used to be at most of um, family events, uh, especially in the Nahum home, because she was invited always till the time she died at the age of 70. And she was very much also part of our life. So yes, there were many Jewish, uh, European Jewish refugees in Calcutta. They became part of the community. And there's a wonderful book that's written about um, this group of people by one of them. And that's called There Where the Poppy Goes. It's by Bemla Hunt. And it's about the story of Benjamin who flees from Poland. There's also another book about Calcutta by, it's not a book, I think it's a smaller publication by Elise Brown Barnett, Memories of My Friends, the Calcutta Jewish Families from 1938 to 1947, who talks about the hospitality she received from Calcutta Jews. I'll end with talking about the most famous Calcutta, uh, European Jew who was in Calcutta. And that was part of this group who came on this ship 
um, was Menachem Salvador. He became the speaker of the Knesset for the Likud from 1977 to 1984. And from 1981 to 84 was the eighth speaker of the Knesset. So we had very remarkable um, European Jews in Calcutta who had wonderful memories because the Calcutta Jewish community not only gave them jobs, welcomed them to the synagogues, helped with their education, helped with supporting their, their family members, and actually made sure that they thrived the, all the time that they were in the city. And I think that's part of the tradition of the Baghdadis who've always been hospitable and philanthropic. And, and while um, in Kolkata or in other places in India, the European Jews, they were still thinking, of course, about um, the family members, relatives left behind in the, in the world, uh, in, the, um, in Europe during the war. And now uh, let's watch two, um, two more uh, short clips and, and about, the, um, about Nahum's family actually left behind in, uh, in Poland. We didn't hear anything about Kshan, but we knew uh, what's going on there, more or less. But we didn't know anything until, until after the war, really, when, when people came and then somebody told me that my father died right before little while before the before they take, took out all the Jews from Russia. No, no, si pruli. Okay, a jele do mershu lo zoheret Polania, o lo zoher Polanit, lo zoher Polania, o abare ze shumashu, bo lo no reret a metim, ve nazov et ze, lo nesaper lo. I feel that only now he starts to understand what his parents went through in Bombay. The anxiety for the fate of the parents and brothers and sisters who remained in Kshanov turned into undeniable news of their death. Now he understands how the Holocaust reached Bombay, but didn't reach him. His parents made sure that life is beautiful for him. הם הכירו אחד את השני, זו הייתה עיירה שכולם הכירו אחד את השני. הם, הם הלכו יחד לבית ספר, הלכו יחד לתנועה, הם גדלו יחד, אז גם כשהם הגיעו לארץ הם חיפשו אחד את השני והקימו מועדון של יוצאי העיירה. בעצם אני, כמו כל יתר הציבור, לא רצינו להתעסק בשואה, למה להתעסק עם, עם השנים ההם? באיזשהו מקום גם שמתי איזשהו אה, וילון, ותמיד אמרתי, אני לא זוכר כלום מפולניה, וזה לא בדיוק נכון, אבל אני זכרתי, אבל אמרתי, אני לא זוכר, אני לא זוכר כלום. אה, זה מין ההגנה הטבעית של בן אדם אה, לאובדן לא כזה. אז היה יותר נוח רק לזכור את הודו? בוודאי, היה יותר נוח לזכור את הודו. וכשרציתי כבר להתעסק בזה, לא היה על מי לשאול. סבא כבר לא היה בחיים, ואימא גם... וזהו. עכשיו יש את הווידאו, אתה עושה את הזיכרון בשבילי. ומה הוא חייך, אבא? סתם, זה בסוף, זה ממש כן. הנה, הוא רוצה ללכת כבר. כן. זה היה מספיק. Okay, um, so Atina, let, let's start from the beginning. How did it uh, even occur to European Jews, um, including also your father, to go to India? After all, 
you know, there was no internet back then. People didn't know as much as they know now. There was no um, very big uh, European Jewish European community that um, that would keep contact with the with the Jews in Europe as it was, for example, in the U.S. So, um, how did it occur that they decided to go to India? Okay, thank you, Magda, and thank you, Nahum, and thank you, Yael, and thank you to everyone who's listening to this um, rather large and broad-ranging uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I mean, no, there was no internet, uh, but uh, you know, there was a remarkable degree of of communication and um, and and actually uh, transnational uh, travel and. Uh, and interest and exchange uh, between uh, actually between India and also other uh, other destinations of refuge such as Iran, uh, certainly going back uh, to the 19th century, but particularly in, in the 1920s already. So I think you know it, it's 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 important for us to understand that it, th these dramatic stories, which kind of collide, right. Uh, in um, the, the the documentary that we that we saw clips of, I mean, you know, that period of the 1930s and then the 1940s uh, in India it was this moment where so much converged, right? I mean, it was it was the it was a period of anti-colonialism. It was already uh, while still being very much part of. The British Empire, still in a sense, the crown jewel, right? It was, um, but it was also already starting in the '30s, uh, a moment where a uh, nationalist anti-colonial movement um, in India was already interested in questions of state building and independence, and that then meets up with the drama of World War II, uh, where the imperial power. Great Britain is fighting, in a sense, you know, sort of a two-front, uh, well, a multi-front war uh, against the uh, the Axis powers, but also still trying to maintain control uh, over its over its colony. And into that, you know, sort of cauldron, uh, then come this wide variety of Jewish refugees who come for very, very different reasons uh, and have quite different um, experiences. So there are those people like Nahum's family, uh, or for example, my father, who are in a sense, accidental uh, refugees. Uh, Nahum's family was trying to flee to Palestine. Uh, my, my father had already fled very early uh, Berlin uh, and spent uh, several years uh, in Tehran, and then finally had uh, the precious affidavit uh, and a transit visa and a ticket uh, from Bombay to San Francisco uh, in, um, in May of 1941, uh, and uh, had to transit uh, through uh, India because he couldn't transit through the Soviet uh, through the, uh, through the Soviet Union anymore because that would have involved having to go through Japan. So uh, he wasn't intending to go to India. He was intending to go to New York via Bombay and San Francisco, but uh, instead he picked a very bad time, uh, which was just the moment. Uh, where the uh, the British, together with the Soviet and the American allies, were planning an invasion of Iran because of the danger of pro-German sentiments in Iran. Uh, and that was a time when uh, the colonial power, Britain, was particularly suspicious of anyone uh, who came from an Axis country, no matter that they already had a J in their passport and were clearly um, anti-Nazi refugees who wanted nothing more than actually to be able to fight, to, to join the fight on the side of the British. But there was a very great fear of the so-called fifth column of uh, Germans infiltrating uh, into India to support 
uh, the, uh, the, 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 the the Nazi cause, which in some ways there was some anxiety, not completely unfounded, uh, that that could intersect with an anti-colonial struggle on the grounds of you know the enemy of my enemy. Uh, so he simply got stuck at first in uh, a, a jail at the border in Kveta, which now Pakistan, uh, where indeed he you know sort of confronted for the first time, well in that dramatic a fashion, uh, already in Iran this existed, but exactly what you saw in the film, which was that persecuted Jews who were fleeing racial and racist uh, oppression and ultimately you know, for their lives and um, who had left behind family and friends and communities that would be completely destroyed were catapulted in a, in this, into this strange situation where they were then treated with what we very well could call white skin privilege. Uh, and, and so they were in this very strange middle position. So that was one, uh, one experience, but some people came exactly. They came from Poland and Lithuania. They crossed the Soviet Union. They got to, they got to Japan and then they fled from Japan to India. Uh, there were, in the 1930s, there were mm -hmm. lots and lots of uh, uh, professionals, as, as Yael said, um, Scott, um, writers, artists, musicians, particularly physicians and technical experts who were able to- Tina, I would also, yeah, I, I would also, you, you just mentioned that the, the group was actually very diverse, many professionals. Uh, and uh, I would actually like to continue uh, with that, but I would also like to mention this colonial angle. And maybe before we will uh, jump to that, we could watch just one clip from the movie that will give us a little bit overview. After school, my father spends his free time at the neighborhood Regal Cinema. Here he watches Tarzan and Charlie Chaplin. His favorite part are the newsreads. World War II is at its peak. The British Empire is fighting the Germans, and half a million Indians join the British Army. A debate takes place in India, whether the Indian independence movement should continue to struggle for independence against the British as long as the war continues. This was also debated among the Jews in Palestine at that time. Jewish soldiers from Palestine are posted in Bombay. My grandfather used to invite them to their home, and my grandmother used to entertain them. So the house behind the Taj became a meeting place for the Jewish soldiers. When the war ended, the struggle for independence escalated under the leadership of Nero and Mahatma Gandhi. And in the streets of Bombay, riots were breaking out against the British Empire. So Atina, you, you mentioned um, the white privilege and, um, and, and also the, the colonial angle. And, and we also have this in the movie when, um, when Nahum's mother attends this uh, high tea um, um, parties. And of course, um, she's basically one of the British uh, ladies. Uh, so, so could you tell us a little bit more about that and also in this context, what happened to the group later, like after uh, after partition and um, yeah, after establishment of Israel also? Yeah, I think that it was a kind of um, precarious and, and fraught privilege, which is why I, you know, talk about this experience as some combination of, you know, trauma, uh, adventure, uh, and, and, and privilege, uh, because, uh, Again, for some for, for, for some of the refugees, especially uh, professionals, uh, uh, as doctors, uh, chemists, uh, those are precisely the groups. Dentists uh, uh, and their wives, who's who actually had sort of the main job of administering this kind of privilege in terms of dealing with servants and making and 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 making contacts. Uh, this uh, actually, this was a sort of remarkably privileged life, except for 
in a sense, the news that would filter in through a wide variety of channels. At, but at the same time, for, for those refugees uh, from access countries, this didn't apply, for example, to Polish Jews, uh, they, uh, they, they also found themselves being treated as enemy aliens or even in some cases as suspect enemy agents, uh, which in fact is what happened to my father because of his business dealings in the bazaar in Tehran. But I should mention actually that, uh, you know, one of, one of the most sort of well-known uh, enemy, uh, suspect enemy agents uh, who was interned uh, in, uh, in, in uh, Indian, either internment camps or then later, uh, so under better conditions, uh, so-called parole centers in, in first in Dehradun and then in um, in, in Puranda was uh, a man named uh, Leopold Weiss, uh, born uh, a Polish Austrian Jew in Vienna, uh, who uh, who at that time already was Mohammed Assad, uh, who became one of the great advocates uh, for uh, for for the uh, Muslim cause and for uh, Pakistani independence. In fact, became Pakistan's uh, first ambassador to the uh, to the United Nations. So that at the same time of this group of, it, it was not such a large group. Uh, we don't know really how many European Jewish refugees there were. One of the sort of most knowledgeable researchers, uh, Margaret Franz estimates, you know, somewhere around 5,000. Not all of those people necessarily identified as, um, as, as Jewish, uh, but uh, the, a significant group of those refugees, uh, which was, after all, the second or third, if you count Palestine, uh, largest group of uh, refugees in Asia. So we have about 17,000 in, Pal in, in, in Shanghai and somewhere around 5,000 maybe uh, in India. Uh, they had this dual experience of also uh, being interned, but interned under conditions where on the one hand, they were surrounded by barbed wire and guarded by Indian guards under, under British command. Uh, and, uh, but they also, yes, uh, had um, actually had uh, local servants uh, who served them. I should, I should add that the British finally were also forced to separate the, uh, the, the, uh, the, Italian, Austrian, and German uh, refugee, uh, re refugees or citizens uh, from those who were Jewish, because that simply was creating disorder so that the, the, the British divided them between so anti-fascists, most of whom were Jews, uh, and Germans or Austrians. Uh, so, and I, and I think that uh, people were able to be released over time. I mean, it, Start, starting in 1939, they were interned, they were released over time. Some of the um, architects, doc, physicians, for example, uh, who worked for particularly Maharajas who had a considerable amount of autonomy in, in their princely states or were otherwise deemed uh, necessary and, and productive uh, were released and several hundred only at the end uh, remained in internment uh, through, throughout, throughout the war. Uh, but it always living this this kind of very physically not uncomfortable, but definitely incarcerated existence in which they were both aware of the extreme frustration of not being able to join on the side that they wanted to be, and also um, either taking advantage of, or in my father's case, also you know really bemusedly critical of uh, the kind of uh, so the racialized hierarchy uh, in 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 which they were in which they were operating, and then uh, after once the war ended, uh, they and and people were finally released quite slowly. Actually, uh, then there was a new confrontation with so sort of, you know a, a version of what Nahum was experiencing uh you know in in 2008 which was that uh there were there was very quickly also outbreaks of violence and and I, at some point my father said you know I started to think that I was actually much safer in my you know internment camp uh than I was uh you know on the streets of Bombay 
uh, as uh, violence broke out on the one hand, independent for in, for independence, but most critically uh, between uh, between Hindus and Muslims. So that refugee Jews who had fled uh, violence and and persecution in Europe uh, then found themselves in a completely other conflict. Uh, with which they themselves really had nothing to do. Yeah, I you know, was pointing out that there really was no anti-Semitism as such in India, but uh, people wanted to leave because of the violence, because they uh, somehow were still longing for a Western world. They did not want to be repatriated to Germany, the vast majority not, uh, but they ultimately uh, having had either very comfortable lives, or it's also the experience of, of internment and detention, uh, wanted to rejoin uh, the West. Not everybody, as y Yael pointed out, and there were there were intermarriages, uh, there were businesses uh, that were that were built up, there were medical practices that were built up. Uh, but I think it's important to understand that, as in most uh, non-Western. Uh, countries of refuge. Uh, Palestine and Israel is an interesting uh, exception there. Ultimately, uh, most, most of these refugees uh, wanted to leave. I just would add one more thing, which is I think it's, it's important to understand that part of the reason uh, that India became uh, in many ways a hospitable refuge despite what the British, uh, you know, despite British policy was because there were so many connections already built up, uh, particularly between Austria, Germany, and India. So there were Indian, there were, there were hundreds of Indian exchange students who had come to Germany, for example, to study med uh, medicine. Uh, there were um, musical exchanges. There was already a German Indian film company, right? Which ultimately we see its influence in Bollywood. Uh, so, uh, you know, the Weimar press was, was full of, you know, photographs of so-called exotic places. Uh, there, uh, there, there was travel, spiritual travel and business travel uh, by Europeans to India in the 1920s uh, and the 1930s. Uh, the Batashu Company uh, had already, you know, been established as a joint Czech Indian venture. So I think we, you know, as we talk about the kind of exotic nature of these European refugees sort of suddenly confronted with this teeming, uh, you know, sort of oriental world, uh, they, uh, they, they, it was the case that they were. Not, this was not completely alien to, uh, to 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 many of the refugees who were, came precisely because they had invitations uh, through their existing through their existing connections. There was a great deal of uh, transnational um, commerce in, in in all kinds of ways. Uh, and, and then, of course, very importantly, was the existence of the local Jewish communities, uh, and particularly the so-called Baghdadi uh, Jewish community, which worked together uh, with the refugees in uh, Jewish relief committees, which were very active, in, uh, particularly in, in Bombay uh, and in Calcutta, but also uh, in, in, other, in other cities. So it was, in that sense, uh, a, a, a unique conglomeration of, of histories uh, and, and groups coming together in India, uh, which made the uh, experience in India maybe in some ways similar to that of refugee Jews in other colonial and quasi-colonial contexts, non-Western contexts, whether we're talking about Bolivia or we're talking about Shanghai, uh, but also uh, actually uh, uh, different because of the, um, the, the ties to the local Jewish communities, but then also the very rapid um, coming of independence and then, and then the violence of partition. Uh, which Thank you, Atina. Thank you. I, I see that it's already, I mean, one, 106 in New York, so it's getting late, especially in India and in Israel, but I would also like to uh, give a chance and open the floor for questions. So far, we actually don't have that many questions from, from the audience. 
I would like to encourage everybody, if you have any question, please ask them. There is an option in the Zoom um, to uh, ask the question and we will forward them to the panelists. But I know that um, the panelists have actually some questions uh, to each other. So I would like to give them a chance now to, to ask them. So please. Yael, would you like to start? Well, actually, uh, the question I had for Atina, she's very well answered, which was how was the experience of European Jews in India different from other parts of the world? And I think you sort of answered that question in your responses already, but is there anything else you wanted to add to that, Atina? I would, thank you. I, I, again, I think uh, it, it makes a difference whether one is, uh, a refugee, for example, in this, uh, you know, sort of complicated uh, situation of Shanghai, for example, uh, where then ultimately uh, the refugee Jews in Hankyu were under the, under Japanese occupation, which was a very precarious situation. Uh, whether one was in um, a place like um, Bolivia, where the challenges had to do, as they did everywhere, you know, sort of with uh, the uh, with with climate, with uh, trying to find a footing, with uh, making connections with other ref with other refugees. Polish Jewish refugees and German Jewish refugees didn't always see uh, see things the same way or even worship um, uh, worship the same way. Uh, so I think there there are there are quite a few sort of you know structural similarities with other um, uh, with, with with other non-Western situations, but India was uh, distinct first of all because it was a larger number for, and India itself was so extraordinarily diverse uh, in terms of the existence of these princely states where uh, professionals could find protection and, and employment uh, because of the, uh, the really quite rich existing tradition of contacts, as I said, uh, and also because ironically, uh, you know, it, because as you said, uh, the Baghdadi community was quite affluent, not everyone in it, but as a community. And they were also extremely important in the international Jewish relief for, um, for Jews everywhere. I mean, the World Jewish Congress uh, headquartered in London uh, had, you know, the Ezra's, the Sassoon's had extremely important leadership, not just support, uh, but leadership from, um, uh, from so-called Baghdadi Jews, and they were also able to walk a very fine line. I mean, people were experienced in living this way uh, between maintaining relations um, with Anglo Jewry and with the British, uh, with, with British imperial uh, powers, uh, but at the same time also with Nehru and Gandhi, uh, and 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 with with the anti-colonial movement. So that combination and that ability to maneuver uh, was extremely important for the, uh, for the, for example, for the Jewish Relief Committee, uh, which was, I will say as a final uh, word, which was, for example, instrumental together with uh, the refugee and the also quite important local Jewish community in Iran that also had a very um, uh, important, uh, actually a group of Baghdadi Jews as well. <laughs> Uh, in, um, for example, uh, setting up relief operations and sending packages to the largest group of, uh, of, of, of refugees outside of Europe, namely Polish Jews, hundreds of thousands, we don't exactly know how many, uh, in, um, in, Soviet, in Soviet Central Asia, which was its own form of, of kind of, you know, colonial space. Uh, so uh, we see how the, the, these forces of imperialism and of international efforts at, um, at relief for European Jews come together. And ne Nehru and Gandhi both made uh, statements uh, of support for, for, that relief, uh, for, for that relief work after, 
after the war. And in fact, uh, you know, representatives of the World Jewish Congress from London came uh, came to India uh, and uh, and to try to raise money, and they did uh, for survivors. Uh, who who had uh, you know gathered uh, in European displaced persons camps, for example. So it's uh, it is an example of how a kind of international uh, global Jewish network uh, works within the context of uh, a global situation of war, post-war decolonization, uh, and and then also increasing violence. Uh, all oh. all it. Yeah, so we actually have a question to Nahum, and uh, this is, um, when leaving Iraq, did your family consider staying in Iran? Why did you choose India? I mean, I, I think this is partially answered in the movie, but maybe you could elaborate a little bit. Was, was Iran even an option? Uh, Iran was not an option. The op Option was the, uh, we came to Baghdad with, with uh, because the Jewish agency told us go to Iraq and we'll take you out from uh, from the, from there. And uh, of course, when we arrived, there was no Jewish agency in in Baghdad. They just uh, sort of uh, uh, made a trip on us, maybe. Anyhow, the. There were no, uh, there was no, uh, no office of the Jewish agency in Baghdad. Later on, there was one, uh, and uh, we came there. And I think it was less than two months that we were in Baghdad itself. But the minute the, the English forces entered, re-entered uh, Baghdad and. Uh, uh, reinstated the, the the king and and the government, the pro-English government. Uh, we just uh, uh, run away. Uh, India was uh, uh, there was a ship to India, and there was a possibility to get a transit visa to India, because our, our passport was full with with visas. To, to who held of countries, Suriname, Curaçao, nationalist China, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, so we got a transit visa for six months to India. After six months, uh, my father and his uh, uh, partner, David, they, they, they didn't even care to go to the uh, and to renew the visa. We remained seven years, uh, six and a half years on a transit visa. So uh, we, uh, and um, to go to, pa uh, to Palestine, to Israel, uh, was, the, uh, was from the beginning uh, the, the, the place we were going. Uh, in fact, we came uh, with a transit visa to, uh, to, to Palestine, Israel. We we were we flew we had a ticket to to Italy with visas to Italy and visas to Czechoslovakia, and uh, we landed in uh, what's uh, in Lod, what's today the uh, Ben Gurion Airport. The next day we we just went to Tel Aviv and forgot to 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 come to the connection uh, connection flight. Two, three days later, and we remained in, in Israel. So you can and, say that uh, we, were, we are among the illegals, the <laughs> immigrants. Uh, uh, that's that a great like, explanation. And I know that Atina has to unfortunately leave us, but um, thank you very much for okay. um, Atina for participation. It was great. And we can still continue. We have actually a few questions uh, to Yael. Uh, the audience is also interested uh, in the present situation of the Jewish community in India. So first of all, how large is the Jewish community uh, or communities? Should we really talk about one or many communities? And also um, what's the current status uh, and situation of, of, the, of Jews in India? If you could talk a little bit about that. Okay, 
Um, actually, that was going to be one of the questions Magdalena wanted to ask me, but I thought you wouldn't have time. So I'm really glad we had the chance to talk to you a little bit about the various communities in India. As I said, uh, India has had biblical connections uh, with Jews and India have had biblical connections. And there was a community in Cochin, which is uh, in the south of India. It was a community that's their origin is layered in myth, but they also had um, Spanish Jews. Uh, there were the black Jews of Cochin and the white Jews of Cochin who came during the Inquisition. I think now they're barely 50 or 30 all over Kerala uh, of Cochini Jews. Most of them emigrated actually to Israel. And so we don't have many of them there. Um, they were never very large community, but they were quite influential uh, and very well known in India because of the beautiful synagogue in Cochin, the Paradesi synagogue, which has these beautiful willow Chinese tiles and it's on Indian stamps. And, you know, there's lots of even Rushdie in his uh, novels talks about this community. So it's well known. Uh, in India, they're very small. There's the Bene Israel community of Bombay, which is also believed to be 2000 years old and they settled in the villages of the Konkan coast. They've always been the largest of the Indian communities. And I think there was maybe 20,000 of them at some point, but I may be wrong on the numbers. I think they're not even maybe a thousand or 1500 left, but they still have a presence in Bombay and they've even been able to get minority status. Many of them have also moved to Israel. Now I know that 80,000 is the last um, statistic I heard, Indian Jews uh, in Israel. And uh, then there's the Baghdadi Jews, that's us, who were the most recent settlers to India. As I said, my ancestors came in 1790. And by the 40s and 50s with partition and a whole lot of other factors, geopolitical factors, they started leaving India in the 40s and 50s. I grew up in Calcutta till I was in school in, in the 70s. When I was growing up, there were about 600 um, Baghdadi Jews in Calcutta. We still have three synagogues and a cemetery. We don't have a minyan, we don't have the 10 men, mostly old people. And it's hard to count how many there are because um, you know, some have Jewish mothers, some were not, their conversion is not really recognized, but I'd say pushing it here and there, maybe 30 or 40 people left in Calcutta um, with significant trust funds um, to support the commu communities. I mean, the, the synagogues and the cemetery, which are archeological sites. And there's a new Jewish community in the East of India, the Beni Manashe, who have been recognized in 2005 as part of the Lost Tribe and their tribal community in the Northeast. There are two other small communities, uh, Judaizing movements have said, you know, that they're big, going to be accepted into the Jewish fold. So I would say the three major communities from the past, one new accepted to maybe on their way to being accepted. But I would say in India, maybe Baghdadis and Calcutta and Bombay, maybe 60, 50, 60 people left, which is very little, a handful in Cochin. And I said the Bene Israel community, which is quite strong at 1500. So we're really a micro community, but I would say the Jews of India, though they've always been micro in their number, have always had massive impact politically, socially, culturally. They've really had significant impact um, on the country. And the other thing I just wanted to mention, um, because I wanted to pick up on, uh, on um, Atina's uh, uh, discussion, is that we were always very cosmopolitan. We were, India was very cosmopolitan, especially in the port cities. So Bombay, Calcutta, Pune were really international cities. And Calcutta, though we think of it as a dump these days, was really, a, a, was, was so significant uh, on the cultural map across the world um, till about the forties. And um, yeah, so I would stop there if that answers the question about where we are today. Yes. Totally. Thank you very much, Yael. And with this glimpse uh, into the present, I would like to actually finish our event. And I would like to thank once again, uh, Nahum, Yael, and also Watina, um, who already left. And of course, also to our audience who participated in the webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, goodbye. Um, Good Thank night, you. and please and stay tuned. Uh, more events of Leo Beck Institute uh, are coming. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.
Thank you, Magdalena. Please like this video and subscribe for more content from the Leo Beck Institute.